We're in the 20th uh, lesson on the study of the biblical flood. <clears throat> and in this study, we're in chapter seven, the second part of chapter seven, looking at dinosaurs. And in chapter seven, part one, we looked at dinosaurs. We're in part two at this time, part two. What caused the extinction of dinosaurs? Well, first of all, I don't even think they're extinct. <laughs> I think what we have is, we, as we develop this, that we actually have them still around. They're just not big like they were in the, in the pre-flood time, antediluvian time. What happened when God created the animals and the trees and the forest and the plants? He, he, he put trees in situ, that is, in place. And so he, he created a whole forest, a uh, standing forest, uh, when he created them. Uh, that's the only thing that makes any sense. He, had, he created animals full grown. He created uh, all kinds of coral reefs full grown. And uh, all of these things, the ocean was filled with fish or sea creatures. And uh, we had multiple, multiplicity of birds flying around. And uh, so we had all of this, and so the ground was fertile, but right now, like in the Amazon rainforest, the soil in the, in, the, in the forest itself is very, very poor, mineral poor. Doesn't have very many minerals in it, because most of the minerals that support trees are in the forest itself, in the canopy, up in the trees that go up sometimes couple hundred foot up, big tall trees. So all of the minerals that are pulled out of the ground and put in those trees to make them grow taller and taller. But whenever God created, uh, he created the forest whole and the ground itself was also filled with uh, minerals and, and uh, that are used by the plants to be able to grow. So he, he actually put these minerals in the trees and the plants and in the animals uh, when he created them. Okay. So what happened then whenever the flood occurred, the animals and the plants and all of their minerals and the building blocks of life, as we call them, such as carbon, calcium, potassium, magnesium, and so forth, when the fossils were deposited by the flood, buried in the sediment that those those uh, minerals were lost and they were lost and not available anymore as they're buried deep in the soil they're not available for plants to pull them up and put them in the plant stems and the and the uh, tree leaves and so forth and so the decrease in the life expectancy and the, and the nutritional value uh, is not available there for the plants also, as we'll de de depict the floodwaters, uh, the floodwaters, I believe they would they were rotating and there was a rotational force. And as they rotated, if you look in a, in a bathtub, normally they'll, uh, the bathtub, the water will swirl uh, to a certain extent. Now, we don't get a lot of it in a bathtub normally. But what we get is this rotational effect, and tides do this. <clears throat> and I believe the flood was tidal in nature primarily. And if that's true, the spinning motion of the water would act like panning for gold, and the minerals would be sorted by their size. And we can get this in a centrifuge. The, uh, the, the mass or the weight, we might think of weight, but it's mass of the molecules would determine where they would go. And whenever I was a boy, we used to take our milk and I'd have to turn a cream separator. We didn't have electricity. And we'd turn it and rotate it. And it would separate out the, the cream from the whole milk. And, but that's a centrifuge. And that would spin that spinning motion. So we would get por portions or layers in the soil that would have more copper in it and 
and other places would have gold in them and other other minerals. And so these minerals would be sorted out instead of mixed in a right proportion. The spinning motion would would separate them out into veins or, or and so some parts of the ground would have too much copper and some parts would ha not have enough. And copper, I'm just using copper as an illustration, it's essential for plants to grow, to have the right amount of copper. Too much is not good, not enough is not good. So again, the building blocks of life, and we I put carbon, calcium, and mag potassium, magnesium, couldn't put copper, and uh, zinc and other things in there. But when these were deposited in the these fossils were buried in the sediment, they became, became unavailable for other for other plants to use them because they're too deep in the soil. And also, the spinning motion would separate these minerals out by their mass, by their weight, and uh, so it would would not have them evenly distributed in the soil. And again, the the soil would lose its fertility. So that would make the plants not as healthy. And uh, that would also make the animals that ate the plants not as healthy. We've already talked about the changes in atmosphere. They decrease the life expectancy of both plants and animals, but they primarily decrease the life expectancy of the animals. <clears throat> but again, the plants would be affected as well. Okay. Changes in the climate after the flood. And again, I uh, argue that the life expectancy of the plants was affected because uh, animals have their life expectancy, particularly the reptiles, because uh, that would decrease their range because you just don't have any reptiles up in northern Canada. They just don't live there. And uh, so you, you can't have them living there. And it's too cold. Right. Mutations that came as a result of changes in the atmosphere. Remember, we talked about how the atmosphere, uh, um, water vapor canopy, <coughs> would shield and added oxygen in, in the atmosphere and added barometric pressure, would shield uh, the Earth from uh, cosmic radiation and even gamma rays, and uh, that would not produce free radicals. And free radicals like ozone are not good for you to breathe. They, they're bad for your body, which would all reduce the life expectancy of all animals. Again, if the animals don't live as long, then that will affect uh, the size of particularly reptiles. The life expectancy of reptiles is reduced. They will not grow as large. Now, <clears throat> remember, reptiles grow all of their lives. And so uh, you take an alligator, if he could live to be a thousand years old, he'd be a lot bigger than he is if he's only 40 or 50 years old. I think your crocodiles can live over 100 years and they get larger and they grow all their lives. They keep on growing. So the life expectancy of reptiles is reduced. If it, if it is, then they will not grow as large. And if your dinosaurs were primarily reptiles, then that would affect the size of the reptiles. <clears throat> Some atheistic scientists claim that volcanic eruptions killed the dinosaurs. Uh, I believe that there were volcanic eruptions, and we'll show this with our flood model later, during the flood. And what we have is we have simultaneous action it does not necessarily prove cause and effect, and that's their problem. They uh, they find the, the, the deposits of, uh, of uh, volcanoes in the sediment, and so they assume that that was a causal factor. It was just something that went along with it. And of course, it didn't help the, the animals, but the flood was killing them. And uh, so, the uh, there was there was about volcanic eruptions during the flood, I believe, as well. And again, some atheist scientists claim that a bolide, and that's from a Greek word bolides, which is something thrown, or an asteroid, or meteorite, or a comet, killed the dinosaurs. This is the new theory, and of course, it's beginning to have some uh, uh, acceptance. 
but there's a bunch of scientists that reject it. So it's not uh, totally uh, unanimously accepted. Some atheistic scientists claim that disease killed the dinosaurs and the disease epidemic had to kill them. Again, uh, it's one of the claims to make. Barnes Svaney, page 23, lists a bunch of views on what killed the dinosaurs. Again, the scientists don't have a consensus as to what killed them. The present view that's pretty being more widely accepted probably, it's the current fad I would call it to explain it, is the Chilixu crater in the Yucatan Peninsula. This is a peninsula of Mexico here, the Yucatan Peninsula. Sticks out into the Gulf of Mexico, on the east side of, of Mexico. And the claim is that a bolide, a, a, uh, probably a small asteroid, hit at that point and created a, a crater at that point. And so the crater supposedly occurred in the Yucatan Peninsula. Here's the location of it, Chalukzu Impact Crater. And it supposedly had an outer rim of 180 kilometers. Now, you have about uh, a kilometer is about six tenths of a mile, roughly, about six tenths of a mile. So multiply this by 0. 0.6, and you'd have the number of uh, the miles it would be 180 times 0. 0.6. Okay, we won't do the math on it, but that's that's what you do. You need now. Here's the location of the Chilixib crater. And uh, they argue that the, this is the present shoreline and that uh, they argued and their thinking is that all of the ice we have has been from water that was in the oceans before before uh, the this, this uh, bolide hit the Yucatan Peninsula. See, they don't, they don't believe that any ice uh, water has been added to the Earth's, Earth's repertoire of water uh, at any time in the past other than just minor portions of water. So with this in mind, they, they took all of the water and they melt it and figure out how much it would raise the ocean levels. And so this would cover this all up right here. The Lake Cretaceous shoreline, they put it way up here. That, that would mean that Florida is totally underwater, right? The pre, there's your present shoreline. Now, if all the ice would melt, then it's supposedly this would be your new shoreline. And uh, so we, we're we going to have to deal with this. This gets into this global warming discussion, okay? We'll come back to it later. But there's there's where it occurred. There's the Gulf of Mexico and there's Cuba, Haiti. That would be uh, Jamaica down here. And so this is Jamaica and Cuba and Haiti. And this is uh, Haiti and Dominican Republic This on this island. Okay. So that's the assumption that's made from the Chilixub crater. Most geologists agree this could occur that a sizable comet or smallest asteroid struck the Yucatan coast at the same geologic, geologic instance, uh, instant as the last of the dinosaurs disappeared 65 million years ago, along with many other creatures. <clears throat> now, again, coincident of act doesn't necessarily mean cause and effect. So that doesn't mean cause and effect necessarily. Uh, the two might have just been coincidental in nature. And uh, so let me illustrate, let's go back to the assassination of President Kennedy. Just because someone was in Dallas, Texas that day doesn't mean that they caused the death of him, but they happened to be there. They might have even been viewing his parade, but they didn't necessarily cause him to, it was a coincidental action. They were there, but they didn't cause it. They were probably well over a million people in Dallas at that time. And uh, yet, <coughs> probably one or just a few people, I'm not sure who killed him. Uh, the claim is that uh, a certain man killed him. 
but uh, there's theories, other theories. But it doesn't matter for our purposes here. Most of the million people or so that were there at that time were not involved in killing him. But they were there, so it was coincidental action. So we got to be careful just because this bolide struck this comet or this uh, small asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula doesn't necessarily mean that it, at the time of the end of the dinosaur, it doesn't necessarily mean that it caused the end. We've got to be real careful about coincident action does not prove cause and effect. That's something we've got to remember. And so that's something some of these people seem to have forgotten. There's a p picture, an artist's view of it, what it's supposed to have looked like as it struck. Okay. Now, many scientists have raised, and this is Morel, the question about whether the impact packed enough punch to make the dinosaurs disappear. See, so these are other scientists that don't believe that this uh, would have enough impact to kill off the dinosaurs. So we got a problem with it. They don't all agree at this uh, impact of this at the Yucatan Peninsula, the Chiluxum crater, that it caused it. It happened at the same time. And uh, just like our uh, volcanoes, they happened at the same time or during, during that time. So I would argue that there were mount volcanoes. I also argue that there were asteroids hitting the Earth during the flood. And uh, we'll, my flood model will, ha will show that they would have would have uh, hit the Earth. <coughs> now, presently, the asteroid impact theory is falling into disfavor in some segments of the scientific community. They're not all accepting it. So again, we have a problem with this theory. Again, the theory is based on a logical uh, presumption that coincidence proves cause and effect and doesn't prove it. This theory also has a problem explaining the survival of climate sensitive animals, such as plankton and turtles, from the Cretaceous into the tertiary periods, but the extinction of dinosaurs, some of which lived in the polar regions. So, Clemens mentions this. And these should have gone into extinction as well, but they didn't. So we have a problem here. And some there were dinosaurs in the polar regions at that time. Dinosaurs in the Arctic region are size sorted from the largest elements in the densest concentration near the base of the bed. And this is where they found some bones or fossils. The matrix is a dark brown carbonaceous siltstone containing scattered calcareous con concretions, as I fact concrete, I would think of. Both litho lithologies contain, lithologies as layers basically of rock, contain large amounts of plant debris and roots, but rare fossil wood. So again, we have this layers putting in here lots of debris of plants. That sounds like a flood to me. And so we have a situation here where they're size sorted uh, by size. And again, moving water would, would sort them by size that would happen. If the North Slope dinosaurs were not migratory, their occurrence at high northern late Cretaceous latitudes provides direct evidence of the ability of some species to tolerate up several months of darkness and to cope with cold air temperatures. Now, if they're reptiles, they have trouble with that. Now, we've already argued uh, and shown how that the uh, northern latitudes could have stayed warm uh, due to the water vapor canopy and the refraction of heat, uh, heat or uh, light, light waves that are known as heat waves. Uh, and uh, we have uh, infrared visible light and then ultraviolet. Those are your three basic spectrums. Then we go above ultraviolet to X-rays and gamma rays and below infrared down into microwaves, which are used for communications. And so what we have here is this would be infrared. Infrared would be refracted back into the down to the ground in the higher latitudes, even if it was dark. That would have given some light to it. Um, so the refraction would have been, might have even refracted visible light back down as well. Now, 
Thus, some of the proposed effects of impacts of the asteroid and comets increase vulcanization, vulcanization and the re related hypotheses may not have been the direct cause of the demise of the dinosaur. In other words, he's saying all of these things they've hypothesized might not fit because of what we see. But my claim is that we have volcanoes that occurring at the same time. We'll explain why later. And also that we would have had uh, particles or large objects uh, like uh, small asteroids striking the surface of the Earth during the flood. We'll lay this out in later lessons. Right. Many Emmanuel wrote, again, all of this is in chapter seven of the book, many, although not all of the proposed mechanisms by which bolide impacts, remember a bolide is something thrown in Greek, so it's like a like a spear, sphere or a javelin, basically. Spears weren't generally thrown, they were they were used for gouging and pushing, but uh, a javelin was thrown. <clears throat> and so Vulcanization lead to mass extinction, rely on massive injection of material in the atmosphere, where it may remain for many years. <coughs> now we've had some volcanoes that in the, in the recorded history times have created a change in climate for just a few years. Uh, we've had some very big volcanoes in Indonesia that have exploded in the past and created two or three years of, of pretty cold winters and summers even that like in southern United States that, that had frost in July in southern Alabama. And and so we we've had this to occur in our in our human time, even in the time of the United States existence as a nation since seventeen seventy six, around eighteen twelve or so. Okay. An approximate time of the war with uh, England, the War of 1812, it's called. It's not obvious that either large scale vulcanization, volcanism, or bolide impacts could loft enough material in the stratosphere for long enough periods to have global effects of magnitudes necessary to explain mass extinctions. In other words, a bolide would put material in the atmosphere and maybe block the sunlight for a while, but it would not keep and it would not stay in the stratosphere for, for a long period of time, long enough to kill off all the plants and animals. Right? So it wouldn't explain mass extinctions. That's what Emmanuel claims. Because this material that gets lofted up in the air from a bolide, it goes up and it starts coming down to the ground very quickly. Now, some of the material can stay up for several months at a time maybe even for a year or two, but it, gradually it's heavier than air, so it eventually filters back down to the ground. Why did not the asteroid impact kill other kinds of animals, such as birds and mammals and reptiles and amphibians? Why are there still reptiles around? They should have died with the dinosaurs who were just big reptiles and amphibians. Why didn't they die? Okay. Shaw says a first order task awaiting an imaginative ecologist is to rationalize and observe extinction patterns in terms of the above stresses. He's talking about all these stresses, volcanoes and bolides and, and other things supposedly that caused it. And he says they need to come up with a way to show it and rationalize it. In other words, he's admitting that uh, their arguments don't hold water. The atheistic catastrophic model is unable to offer a reasonable explanation of these extinction patterns. Remember, we've got two views in geology, the uniformitarian geology, which has generally been re rejected pretty much, and that's slow processes, nothing big happening. They've, the evidence is overwhelming that uh, we have had catastrophic events to occur, catastrophes to occur. So the atheist then adopts his catastrophic model, which we talked about in the first few classes. So we can go back to those if you want to go back and read and study this in the first couple of chapters. They just can't explain the extinction patterns. 
my, I believe my fraud model introduced in this study explains these extinction patterns as we develop even further, they get it'll tie together even better. Now, toxic compounds are lofted into the air when a bolide hits the earth a large meteorite. The meteorite is a is big one. And uh, what we have is a large meteorite, maybe uh, you know, a few hundred kilograms up up in larger in size to even a small asteroid. What they do is they uh, they volatilize uh, what they volatilize compounds, organic compounds are volatized. So the organic materials then are, are burnt and then they're separated and you can't tell it's organic anymore that have those properties. Novel gases, some of your gases, uh, argon and so forth, they uh, they are they are volatilized at maybe eight to eight hundred to sixteen hundred degrees Celsius, whereas your organic compounds are volatilized and broken down at about four hundred degrees Celsius. And so a fraction of the organic compounds surviving the impact must have been even less than three times ten to the minus fifth, he says. In other words, your organic matter should have disappeared. Uh, for this reason, it's also unlike the toxic substances from the meteorites, such as HCN, and that's hydrogen cyanide or hydrocyanic acid, were a major cause of extinctions. Hydrogen cyanide is the gas that's used in gas chambers, or was, to kill people. And so it would, it would, it's very toxic. It can kill animals and plants and people as well. So it's very toxic. The dust cloud theory, there's another theory that's Yabushushi, Yab, Yabushida, Yabushida and Allen. Now this is from Sky and Telescope. They're not a real scholarly journal, but they, they advanced the dust cloud theory, which has been advanced. Supposedly a cloud of dust from some of the galaxy, uh, the Earth and our solar system went through a cloud, a dust cloud. And this dust then overwhelmed uh, the solar wind, and when it did, it blocked out the solar wind and light, and uh, then we got cold for a while, and so until this dust cloud was cleared up. I I really think that we have a situation where this is not likely to occur, because the large Jovian planets that would be uh, Jupiter all the way out to Uranus. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and uh, those planets, those Jovian planets, uh, I believe there are four of them. <clears throat> those those planets, they are they would sweep out comets and dust and other things, protecting the Earth itself because they're so big. Their huge gravity would suck those dust clouds into them before they even, and of course the solar wind would push them out to drive them out. The solar wind is particles coming from the sun at high speeds. They would push the dust uh, out away, and of course the big Jovian planets would uh, pull them in with their huge gravity and pull these, these dust clouds into them as well. So they would better be like vacuum cleaners to clean out, uh, to clean out. They may be put there by God to protect us, <coughs> to do that very thing. Again, God hasn't told us why he, why he made them. Yabushida, Yabushida and Alan claim the clouds, gas and dust would overwhelm the over, over flowing solar wind. So they claim it would have over, overwhelmed the solar wind. But if it overwhelmed the solar wind, <coughs> the solar wind would still be pushing constantly on it. And of course, the big Jovian planets would be attracting it with their gravity. And so again, we have them pulling this out like vacuum cleaners. So large amounts of any dust cloud would be swept from space by the Jovian planets before the cloud reached the Earth. And again, uh, the solar wind would be pushing out on them all constantly. And particles come from the solar wind uh, from the uh, sun itself, uh, and they come at high speeds, and they would they would have a force of morning dust. 
and the dust must be in orbit around the sun, or the massive gravity of the sun would rapidly accelerate it into the sun if the solar wind didn't push it out. So if they argue the solar wind didn't push it out, the sun would suck it in with its huge gravity. So I, I just, I won't fit very well. Got a problem with it. If the solar wind can't hold it out, then, uh, then it can't push it away, then the gravity of the sun would pull it in and absorb it. There's no evidence that the solar wind is diminished in intensity so as to allow the Earth to be pelted with cosmic dust. <clears throat> now, what they've done is they have looked into the rocks and they claim that there's no evidence the solar wind has ever been overwhelmed in the rocks on the moon, moon rocks and other, other sources that they've gotten. So they can't find any evidence. There should be a large amount of dust on the moon as well, and there's not. If we had a huge dust cloud to overwhelm the Earth, the moon would have surely gotten a, a bunch of it. And so, but it doesn't have a large amount of dust on the moon. It's not there. Werner theorizes that a reduction in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere was a contributing factor in the of dinosaurs. Again, Werner is coming up with, he's got evidence of the reduction of it, which we agree, and I believe occurred, but he's uh, saying it's a contributing factor. I say it's a coincidental action. It went along with it. And the flood was killing them and killed them at the same time that the oxygen level changed. All of this happened coincidental. Well, this coincidental action not cause and effect. The Fox flood model, the model I theorize and postulate, uh, that there was a reduction in atmospheric oxygen during the flood. Well, this occurred during the flood. Again, coincidental action did not prove cause and effect. That's a that's a flaw in their reasoning here. <clears throat> the weathering of organic matter results in the uptake of O2 from the atmosphere and the lowering of atmospheric oxygen might have contributed to the Permio-Triassic extinction. That's Burner. Now notice he said might have, it's the theory. And again, we have coincidental action occurring, which I agree occurred, but uh, that doesn't prove cause and effect. The cause of the end Permian mass extinction appears to involve, and Irwin probably has it better, a tangled web rather than a single mechanism. Well, what we have here is there is a single mechanism. That's the flood and the things that went with the flood. And that's the tangled web is all the things that went with the flood. So my flood model would have volcanoes occurring and large objects hitting the earth at the same time. And we also have the introduction of ice into the earth itself, which we'll come to later. <clears throat> now, hyperbaric chambers have been used to accelerate the healing of burn victims and other injury victims. Hyperbaric chambers uh, show something that as if we had this hyperbaric condition before the flood, we would have a, a completely different situation for life to exist. Hyperbaric chambers have oxygen enriched air under high pressure, higher pressure than our one normally experiences. Now, they are not, they don't have things like it was before the flood, unfortunately. So a hyperbaric chamber is not a, not a total examination of my flood model, but there are factors in the hyperbaric chambers that are very helpful to explain my flood model go with my flood model showing how it operated. A water vapor canopy would cause the interleaving atmosphere to atmospheric pressure to be greater than the normal pressure today. Again, we've already argued that the atheists themselves argue that the barometric pressure had two to three times what it is now at, in the past, plus it had additional oxygen. Whereas we have about 21% oxygen now, it had 35 to 39% oxygen. There's some evidence, to, scientific evidence to that effect, <clears throat> or information in the in the fossils or in the, uh, in the geology record to prove it. <clears throat> A greater pressure might accelerate the growth of dinosaurs and also increase their long, longevity, and we see that occurring. Now, why would it increase the longevity? Well, if you increase the 
barometric pressure and the amount of oxygen, then the breathing rate, the respiration rate goes down, which means the heart rate goes down. So the animal can uh, breathe easier and his heart works much more slowly. And all of that is very good for you. If you can get your heart rate down and your metabolism is still good, uh, that's good. That's what athletes try to do. That's why people exercise. <clears throat> The absence of this elevated barometric pressure would lower the life expectancy of both man and animals. Now we see the life expectancy of men before the flood uh, close to a thousand years in some instances. And we have several men in the Bible mentioned that lived over 900 years of age. Methuselah being the oldest that was recorded, 969 years. But <clears throat> If we had an increased barometric pressure and increased oxygen level, that would have partially at least explained their increased longevity. Elevated barometric pressure constant with elevated levels of oxygen in the atmosphere will do the following. Increased amount of oxygen in the blood enabling the body to fight infection more efficiently. We're going to show this as we develop this now. And this gets into our what we've already talked about with Pasteur effect. The Pasteur effect basically says that with increased barometric pressure and oxygen level in the water or in, the, like in grape juice, for example, we won't get the yeast fermenting. It won't go through the Pasteur point, become anaerobic. And uh, so what, what happens is it doesn't produce alcohol under those conditions. Alcohol is a poison. And my claim is that, and, bar and hyperbaric chambers show this because they, they will heal wounds much more quickly. Hyperbaric chambers can heal wounds much more quickly. So if we increase the amount of oxygen in the blood, the body can fight infection more efficiently. And uh, because what happens is, your body actually makes uh, an allotrope of oxygen and places it in actually hydrogen peroxide. It makes hydrogen peroxide and puts it on bacteria that have invaded the body. That's one of the ways it fights infections. It actually manufactures uh, hydrogen peroxide and use it in the body. I'm not saying you ought to be drinking hydrogen peroxide. Some people do that. I think it might be unwise to do that. But your body actually makes it to fight the disease. Uh, this would occur because of Henry's law. It would increase the oxygen level. Now, Henry's law said if you double the barometric pressure, you'll double the amount of oxygen in the water. And uh, of course, uh, what that does is an increased barometric pressure increases the oxygen in the blood, which is mostly water. And that's very interesting because more oxygen in the blood. And it would also pull carbon dioxide out of the blood more readily through the lungs. And it would increase oxygen, decrease, and pull out carbon dioxide out. <clears throat> elevated barometric pressure, constant with elevated levels of oxygen, will also do this reduce the rate of respiration and rate of the pulse, making the organism healthier. So, again, we see that happening. If you reduce the respiration, the breathing rate, and the pulse rate, the rate of the heart rate, uh, will increase the longevity of the organism. Uh, there's basically about so many beats in your heart before it finally gives up. And uh, what we do is, <clears throat> if we slow down the heart rate, it tends to make the animal live longer, generally speaking. Now, there's exceptions. But that's a general rule. In order to understand this more fully, we need to understand the concept from chemistry and physics of partial pressures and gases, which we've already talked about. The human body produces ozone, O3, from, from the oxygen in the blood. Ozone kills bacteria and fungi. And they produce hydrogen peroxide as well. And they kill parasites. All of this kills parasites. And, and it can even destroy some viruses, kill them. 
uh, Byron says they argue about whether they're even alive or not. Now keep that in mind. I'll, I'll admit that. Live bacteria, now here's from a scientific journal, including SRRs and E. coli, that's some pretty nasty stuff, were injected in the dermis of the skin of guinea pig backs. Heat killed bacteria in the same concentration were injected as controlled in order to determine the influence of bacterial protein on the lesion size. So they took heat killed bacteria of the same concentration, same bacteria, but they killed it and injected it in the, in the control that is other guinea pig bags to see what would happen. And the influence of bacterial protein, how would just the bacterial protein, or which it wasn't living, half of the animals were injected with ampicillin, which is a, 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 a penicillin type of antibiotic, Three, uh, six milligrams intraperiodontally, and the inoculated animals were then caged in controlled environments and breathed 45 percent, 21 percent, and 12 percent oxygen. Well, first of all, none of these are what we have in the pre flood. If they had gone 35 percent, this is too much oxygen and it's too high. But if they had gone 35 percent, it would have been a better test of my, of my hypothesis. The guinea pigs were examined at 24 and 48 hours at the dimension of the infectious necrosis, that's dead tissue, that uh, developed at each inoculation site was measured. The results revealed, in fact, that the effect of ri rising oxygen tension was as having more oxygen and having more beverage pressure was marginally superior to the giving of antibodies. In other words, more oxygen was a little bit better marginally, but a little bit superior to antibiotics. We we are so excited about antibiotics that I, I believe they're good for us. They can, and they can be used in a good way and they're very helpful to save many lives. But right here he's saying just to increase oxygen does a little bit better than just the, than antibiotics. Isn't that interesting? Uh, again, um, my claim is that this uh, existed before the flood then it was no need to antibiotics. We had something that was even slightly better than antibiotics. And again, they're using 20, 45% oxygen, which is a little bit too much. I think 35% is would be much better. Too much oxygen is toxic. <clears throat> the most important finding was that the hyperoxia, and hyper is from the Greek preposition hooper, and, uh, and it means more oxygen, greater uh, elevated oxygen, and antibiotics, when, when they have both of them, they were additive. <clears throat> so that only rarely was there evidence of infection seen animals treated with both hyperoxia, increased oxygen, and antibiotics. While every infection site became infected with hypoxic and hypoxic, that is hypo, who, this is from hypo, is under. So a decreased oxygen level. Now let's go back and see what their decreased levels were. From 21%, they went down to 12% oxygen. And so what happened is this is the lower values animals that are not relative to any antibiotics. If they didn't have antibiotics, they had lower oxygen levels. They surely really got infected. Infection was really bad. So necrosis is, and that's from the word for death, and the death of the cell or tissue, portion of the tissue of a living organism. Tissue began to die. Hyperbaric therapy has even affected the eyes. <clears throat> now, what we have is, if you put increase the barometric pressure, it affects the shape of your eyeball. And uh, what they found is, increased hyperbaric therapy, increased barometric pressure, has caused a blurred distant vision or a sudden ability to read without glasses. Is presumed to do the change in the lens, either a change in the shape or the change in the refraction of the eyeball. That's very interesting. Uh, this may affect, and this barometric pressure may affect your eyes. It may be that when we have a high barometric pressure, your vision may improve or may get worse, depending on the shape of your eyeball. So we may have times we can read better than other times. And it may be linked in with the barometric pressure. And this is this shows that this can affect even our vision. 
So I, my claim is if we had an increased barometric pressure, the eyeball would not have as much pressure to push out on it and perhaps to change the shape of the eyeball and, and cause uh, problems with vision. The shape of the eyeball will affect your vision. It gets into lenses and, uh, and so forth, so we won't get off into that any further. Hyperbaric therapy aids the human body in combating bacteria, parasites, and fungi, and that's PARC. So they can all be combated with hyperbaric therapy. Parasites, fungi. Now, these are the very things that cause all kinds of health problems. But you see, hyperbaric therapy can aid it. Now, the problem is that hyperbaric therapy still doesn't go back to what we had in the prior prior to the flood and in limited time. Because they only put them into the hyperbaric chambers for a, a short period of time and take them out of it. And they, they put 100% oxygen rather than 35%. And we'll talk about why they do that later, but uh, there's a reason for doing that. There are some problems with hyperbaric chambers, but many of these problems are related to the axis of increasing the pressure and decrease and or decreasing the pressure, compression and decompression. This was not a problem in the environment where, the, where they're born into increased pressure and lived every day in that environment. Now, <clears throat> a diver that comes up from the ocean, he's been breathing uh, compressed air. That air, when he comes up, begins to expand outward. The air, the air bubbles, if he has some small bubbles in his blood vessels, those bubbles enlarge, get bigger. If you get big bubbles in your in your blood, it tends to cause some pain and it can even cause death. And it's called the bends. <clears throat> and particularly nitrogen bubbles, they become a real problem. <clears throat> so increased pressure. So uh, a diver has to come up slowly and let his body get rid of all that uh, gases that he's breathed in out of his blood. So he comes up slowly and comes up a ways and sits there and breathes a while and then he comes up even again higher. <clears throat> so this is a problem, but you see it was no problem when they lived there day after day in this increased pressure and about 35% oxygen. Hyperbaric chambers use 100% oxygen instead of 35% postulated by the interlude for the interlude in atmosphere. And of course, 100% oxygen removes the danger of decompression sickness. That's why they do it. Commonly called the bends. Because it's nitrogen bubbles that cause the trouble. Your oxygen will go ahead and mix with your blood. So they, they put 100% oxygen, that way they can decompress them fairly quickly. <clears throat> but 100% oxygen becomes toxic, so they can't leave them in there very long. So they're not testing what we had before the flood with this 100% oxygen. It has it has another problem, but it does it does improve health. It has its effects. It's toxic can kill a person 100% oxygen if one's kept in a chamber too long. It'd be fatal. <clears throat> Now, Sheffield claims the optimum dose of oxygen has not yet been established. It is clear that most individuals with wounds require no additional oxygen, whereas others require a very high dose of hyperbaric oxygen to achieve healing. Some people need it, some don't. And it's probably just a little have to do with their body. There's likely a specific dose for each individual, but unfortunately, much work is still needed in this area. I think the 35% oxygen and two or three times barometric pressure is what we need. And that would be helpful to everybody. That's my claim. It's most likely that barometric pressure was two to two and a half times the present atmospheric pressure. And the barometric pressure, two to two and a half times our present barometric pressure. And the 35% oxygen, we would obtain most of the benefits of hyperbaric condition without the drawbacks of 100% oxygen oxygen toxicity. But you see, none of their hyperbaric chambers are set up this way. Well, you'd have to keep a person in that chamber for several days if they were under and had a bad infection. But I think they would if they could have a chamber big enough. You'd, you'd almost get claustrophobia if you were locked up in something like that for two or three days. It would be very, it would be confining. It would be a problem. 
That's one way they tortured people. And uh, they use that for torture. And uh, at some point, you're, you get so confined, it, it just drives you nutty almost. <clears throat> so what we run into is uh, if they would have used two and a half times and 35% oxygen and had them in a big chamber where they could stand up, walk around, leave them there for two or three days, I think they would see a great amount of benefit from it or people who had uh, some kind of bad infection, I think it would have helped them. So that's my claim that that would be a factor. Of course, they need to build a big chamber and have a, uh, have a pressure and make it big enough for them to move around a bit to get rid of the problem with claustrophobia. Let's look further. Key to understanding the effects of increased vertical pressure caused by the water vapor canopy is in remembering that this had the ability to help to prevent disease. It was probably pro prophylactic and not so much as uh, as uh, having the ability to cure disease. So if you prevent the disease in the first place from ever happening, you're far better off than trying to cure it after it's happened. Better to lock the barn door than let the horse out and have to bring it back in. It's the old saying. <clears throat> if neither bacteria, parasites, nor fungi can grow as rapidly in these environments, the body's defenses could more easily combat them and, and prevent them from ever ever getting a toehold or a foothold in the body. And so that's that's the prophylactic, preventing, preventative rather than cured, curing so much. And I believe it will help to cure, but by, by far the most, most important benefit is to prevent it. Werner claims that the oxygen content of the atmosphere was almost 40 percent about 290 million years ago, page 604 of his, of his side. Graham claims it was around 35 percent. We've already shown these earlier in, in our study during the late Paleozoic. We disagree with their dating of this evidence, but their name, with their name of the period of time. But uh, the levels of oxygen are probably pretty close to being right, between 35 and 40 percent. I would I would opt up to or maybe 35, 36, 37 percent. We have two sources that got 35, one that got 39. Most dinosaurs are about the size of a chicken. Most people think of being huge, but most dinosaurs are about the size of a chicken. They weren't very big. And we have a number of reptiles about that size today. And so we don't have, we, and I'm claiming we still have dinosaurs around. Horned iguana lizard looks like a miniature dinosaur. The rhinoceros iguana looks like a miniature dinosaur. There's a horned iguana lizard, and he certainly has horns on him. And if you make him real big, he'd look like some of those uh, dinosaurs that we see. Here's a rhinoceros iguana, and uh, they were thought to be extinct, but they found them, and they, they live in the Caribbean, Caribbean, some of the islands there. And uh, there's one right there, man, and I just caught him. And so that's where an ostrich was gone. It's the, like I say, they were, they were considered to be dinosaurs and supposed to be extinct, but they found them living, actually. Then we have what's called uh, living fossils. Atheists have found certain fossils in the cemetery rock and assumed that they were extinct. And then lo and behold, they found out later they weren't extinct. Later they found these fossils living in certain parts of the earth. Okay, they were, they were still around. They even gave a name to these fossils, Lazarus Toxa. Now, if you know the Bible very well, you know very well where they get this, they were resurrected, see. <laughs> so they thought they were extinct, but they found them resurrected. They found them around. But they called them Lazarus Toxa. That's what they call them. This Lazarus toxa disappeared from the record during the late Permian. This is quote of urban, but did not become extinct for they reappear in middle Jurassic rocks. First recognized in gastropods and phenomena and widespread among bivalves, two valves, brachiopods, and other toxa, demonstrating both the extent of sampling problems and the importance of undiscovered refuge, refuge, see, in the preserving many lineages. So they said that we, we thought they were extinct and we were going to say this is this many millions of years ago these 
things become extinct, but now we found them still living. So we call them Lazarus toxa. And so we have a problem with it. And our, we have a problem with both our sampling right here and sampling problems and the importance of undiscovered refuges, refugia. And so that's plural for refuges. And now, the coelacanth was an index fossil. Now, what I mean by index fossil is a fossil that they use to date the rock. They said, okay, we have this fossil, which we know is extinct, and we found it in these rocks. We don't find it in other rocks of the different layers. So it became extinct at some time. And, this, and for many years, they used the coelacanth as one of the index fossils. Some old books, you'll find it in them. And they're thought to be extinct. <clears throat> An index fossil, according to the definition, also known as guide fossils, indicator fossils, or zone fossils, are fossils used to define and identify geologic periods or faunal stages. Now, flora is the plants and fauna is the animals, stages of the, of the supposed evolution of certain animals. Now, the coelacanth is one of those so-called index fossils, or was at one time. They had to rewrite their books because they found them, they found them actually living. They're still alive in the world. So they used this coelacanth as one of their fossils, index fossils, because they hadn't found them anymore, so they said they, they must become extinct, or they were wrong. Here are your index fossils for various periods of time that they've used for index fossils. Notice many of them, most of them are actually sea creatures. Most of them are. And that's, I find that very interesting. And all of these periods are supposed to have these different index fossils in them. Uh, you see this, this, uh, shell seashell here and you know that's jurassic you see this seashell here and you know it's permian you see this one is pennsylvanian and so forth you see this right here and you know it's cambrian period and so we see all of these so-called index fossils and again they've, uh, they've had to change them because they've actually found them living Index fossils work on the premise that although different sediments may look different depending on the condition in which they were laid down, they may indicate include the remains of the same species of fossil. So they may look different, but they have the same species of fossil since some fossils became extinct. Then we say these sed sedimentary rocks were laid at different times. If the species concerned was short-lived, in geologic terms, lasting a few hundred thousand years, then it's certain that the sediments in question were deposited within that narrow period, time period. Of course, now it's circular reasoning, like a dog chasing his tail. Because the problem is, they've assumed that these fossils were short lived and that they evolved, and then they go back to use them to prove that the evolution occurred. And again, it's circular reasoning for us, what we have. I have a problem with that kind of reasoning. If we found the fossil in later sediments even today, then it's not extinct. And so the, the whole system then falls apart, starts falling apart as they find these index fossils still alive. <clears throat> We've not found the fossil in later sediments. So now here's their argument. If we found the fossil in later sediments, then it's not extinct. Well, that's certainly true, or even today it's certainly true. Certainly true if it's if it's found today, it's not extinct. We have not found the fossil in later sediments. Well, I always say they're denying the antecedent. Here's your antecedent up here. I'm running my mouse over it. We have, we have found the fossil in later sediments. We have not found the fossil in later sediments or even today. So they deny the antecedent, which is a logical fallacy. And the certainly you prove nothing. Therefore, it's extinct. The fact we haven't found it doesn't prove it's extinct. And because they keep finding stuff they thought was extinct. But remember the Lazarus talk book. Argument contains the logical fallacy of denying the antecedent again. Bad reasoning on the part of these people. They don't reason well. And uh, so by virtue of that, they have a problem. We can't reason well. We can't. Uh, we have to be very careful of believing what they say. Before the arrival of humans, the largest carnivores in the region were Wambi, Wambi, 
a 110 pound python like snake with a 12 inch girth, a uh, giant land crocodile known as Quick Quick Quin Kana, and a Gona, a kind of Gona, Gona lizard, a monitor lizard called Megalania, weighing as much as a ton, that's 2,000 pounds, that's approximately 100 kilo, 1,000 kilo, I'm sorry, 1,000 kilograms right in that neighborhood are more than 20 feet long. Remember, uh, 3.28 feet is a meter, so divide that by 3.28 and you'd get, that's about seven meters long, roughly. Megalania would have dwarfed present-day reptiles. So this, when, when humans came there, these things were there, right? Before they came, all of these uh, uh, big animals were there. I say they were there right after the flood. Scientists have a long, for a long time discussed whether or not dinosaurs were ectotherms or endotherms. Now these are fancy words that use. Ectos is Greek for out of, and endo is Greek for inner, inside. And of course, thermo, therm is heat. So the ectotherm is a cold-blooded animal gets its heat from outside its body, and endotherm generates its own heat. An endotherm has to have more food because he has to he has to eat his body up with his food as well as move around. So ectotherms are cold-blooded animals. Endotherms are warm-blooded animals. <clears throat> now, let's look further. American showers use the ratio of the two isotopes of oxygen, 8O18. We talked about that earlier. And oxygen 18 and oxygen 16. 8016 in the bones of Tyrannosaurus rex skeleton determined that it was warm blooded. So, being warm blooded, it would have had more uh, HO18 than 16 than the normal average. The warm blooded would have driven the smaller ones, uh, let a lower mass uh, oxygen out of his system. So, that's their argument, and that's just pretty pretty reasonable argument. <coughs> They were warm blooded, uh, whether they were warm blooded or cold blooded. And this, they concluded that it was warm blooded, but not, and not cold blooded. But the problem with this is Barrican showers, and we'll get back to the problem with it in just a minute. Barrican showers have jumped to the conclusion without studying enough about modern endotherms. This is what Ruben says. Mammals, says Ruben, sometimes keep their limbs much cooler than the, their bodies. I know my, my hands in the wintertime may be cold, whereas the trunk of my body may be around 98.6, but my hands may be only 90 degrees, may be cold. And so the, the limbs may be cooler than the rest of the body. That happens, particularly in, in the cold, when it gets cold. You can see that happen. Again, we have one side that's disagreeing with another side. That's so the fact that you can find uh, in the limbs of these uh, uh, dinosaurs, some of them, in this case, Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, the fact that you can confine these isotopes uh, doesn't necessarily prove it's warm, it's cold-blooded or warm-blooded. So it depends on where you find them in their limbs. Again, we have one scientist disagreeing with another. Jimson Jimson has other reasons to doubt the findings. In her own preliminary study of the T-Rex bone, she has found growth rings in the bones. Now, here's what here's what we run into. Trees have growth rings in them. And uh, animals that grow all their lives have growth rings in their bones. So reptiles have rings in their bones. But, uh, we find mammals don't have. So their bones will look, will look different. And so ectothermic animals have rings in their bones, like tree rings. <coughs> T-Rex has, has rings in the bones. <coughs> so T-Rex is probably not a mammal. Uh, Monastersky dis discusses this problem extensively, pages 312 to 313, uh, 1994. Columbia also argues all these isotopic uh, 
signals might say more about the bones decay than their temperatures during life. Calandria himself sprinkled a bit of cold water on the evidence for one-blooded dinosaurs when after the talks about showers and barrack, he discarded his own plant talk and launched into a cautionary tale. So he got up and said he, had, he was supposed to speak on something else and he got off on this. Uh, probably does like Marion has done a time or two. Okay. <laughs> okay. He now sees isotopic and geochemical signs that the calcium phosphate of fossils may not be the calcium phosphate of the bone of the living animals. Oh, so the calcium phosphate might not been in the living animal. Groundwater may have dissolved the original mineral and replaced it with different phosphates. So it may have been contaminated. And that would just throw the whole thing out the window. And so we got a, we got a problem. We've got to be careful with it. And that's what he's cautioning about. Again, that's that's good science now, see. Because you gotta say, okay, how did this O eight eighteen isotope get there? Did it get there through contamination or was it there in the original? And he says it could have been contaminated. Now, to assume that a homeotherm is an endotherm. Now, we've got a different term now. We have an endotherm is he's warm-blooded. Homeotherm has the same temperature throughout his body. But an endotherm is warm-blooded. Now, ectotherm was cold-blooded. Homeotherm has the same temperature. Now, what we have an endotherm would tend to be uh, homeotherm, but that's not saying that ectotherms couldn't be that as well. And it's a weak argument at best. And uh, John Rubin, a zoo, zoo ph physiologist at Oregon State University, Corvallis, the dinosaurs may well have been homeotherms, having pretty much the same temperature because of their sheer bulk. Uh, the massive size of them would have kept their temperature fairly constant. It would have generated enough heat to create a stable body temperature. And so the in increased heat of the body as a result of moving and walking around and breathing and their heart beating would have kept their body temperature stable. And but every physiologist knows that a homeothermy tells us nothing about the animal's metabolic rate. And so again, now he's making arguments from other other arguments here. So again, there, one scientist is shooting another one down. The pride of these scientists won't let them. <laughs> I mean, if they if they think they've got an argument that can't be answered, they'll just speak out a lot of times. And so what we have is. These guys may be atheists, but but they shoot down another atheist arguments. So Satan does work against Satan, doesn't he? Warm blooded animals have thin bones or cartilage in their nasal passages called respiratory turbinates. Turbinates. Now can't think about this. When you breathe in through your nostrils, you have this respiratory turbinates in the in the nostrils, in your in your cartilage, it's cartilage. These turbinates humidify and warm the air in, in the lungs, and dehumidify the air as the, as the animal exhales. Now, how does this work? They're called conchi, tiny bony layers in the nasal passages. What happens when you breathe through your nostrils? It the air goes into your sinus cavities and rotates in a spinning motion. And what this does? If the air is dry, it picks up moisture out of the sinus cavity and keeps it from drying out the lungs, the air that goes in. And if you breathe, when you breathe out, if you breathe through your nostrils, it spins it the other way and puts the humidity from your lungs back into the, into the uh, sinus cavities. And so it, re, it puts it back in. So it comes, it comes, uh, picks up moisture going in and, and it drops off moisture going out. And that's what happens. Now, if you're breathing through your mouth, you don't get this effect. Now, I had my nose broken by playing basketball, a non contact sport, and uh, shattered the cartilage in my nose and I have trouble breathing through my nose. That's why my mouth, is, I breathe a lot through my mouth, so my mouth stays open a lot. 
and uh, so I, I, I just can't help it. That's how I have to breathe. But uh, I had surgery and they couldn't repair it. The bones were shattered, the cartilage was shattered in the nose. So I have to breathe through my, through my mouth to a large extent. But uh, the turbinites uh, are there in, only in warm-blooded animals. They're not in, uh, in dinosaurs. They're not in uh, uh, reptiles. Reptiles don't have them. Their presence in a fossil animal signals endothermy, that is warm-blooded. Scans of several theropod dinosaurs show no evidence of respiratory, respiratory turbinates in these active predators. This puts a chill on out of endothermic dinosaurs, warm-blooded dinosaurs. In other words, there's several things that would show the dinosaurs were cold-blooded. They don't have the turbinates in their nostrils, in their nose cavities. And secondly, their bones have, have rings on them. There's some other things about them that would fit it too. And so I would say they're almost certainly cold-blooded animals. And remember reptiles that are basically reptiles. Reptiles just keep growing all their lives. So if we've got something like hyperbaric uh, increased, uh, remember depression, increased oxygen, and very fertile soil, and the plants being very fertile, and no, nothing to mutate, then we would have a situation where these these reptiles could live to be, maybe maybe it might have been some reptiles that God created that was killed in the flood. And so they could have lived a couple thousand years. There are reptiles today that live over 100 years of age. And we've already shown two of them, crocodiles and, and the Gonkosala tortoises, for example. Uh, even even the American alligators live about 50 or 60 years. That's a pretty long time. But we have two or three things that would show us that they almost certainly were reptiles. This in accord with the growth rings found by chimpsony, the lack of terminites in the nasal passages, the fact that they laid eggs like reptiles and other similarities to dinosaurs, the reptiles. All of this fits in. As cold-blooded animals, they grew all their lives. I pointed out, it explains the large size of some of the dinosaurs. They just got bigger and bigger. After all, petrosaurs could not be active flyers if they were not endotherms. That's what he argues. They had to be warm-blooded. In fact, one petrosaur fossil shows impressions of hair, indicating that they had some kind of fur-like insulation. This would make sense only if they're small, but but body endotherms trying to prevent a heat loss. <clears throat> so fur and and feathers would be a, a detriment to a cold blooded animal. Why? Because if he overheated, it would hold the heat in and it would be detrimental, and it would insulate him from absorbing heat from outside his body. So again, fur and feathers would not be a help to them. They're, they're detrimental to, to cold-blooded animals. You just don't see it on them. And that's why you don't see it on them. Not Atheists cannot determine how the extinct bird, Pelagornius sandersi, flew. It had a wingspan of from 20 to 24 feet, with a weight between 48 and 88 pounds. This weight it should have been difficult for it to fly, but it has short legs and was obviously not a land bird. Again, we got a problem with it. Again, if it were flying in an atmosphere that was two or three times the density of our atmosphere today, it could easily fly. So it, it uh, after the flood, it wasn't able to fly. And so I would say God didn't have a large form of that bird on the ark. And uh, what we have is a variation of it that's much smaller was probably on the ark rather than uh, that, that size of the bird. Okay. But there it is. There's a California condor and the royal albatross. I think the albatross is the biggest bird we know of that has the biggest wingspan of any bird. But this thing dwarfed an albatross. That's the one big bird. Okay. What they claim they look like. Of course, they just got the fossils to look at them. Right. It's supposed to be just giant albatrosses, is what they're supposed to be. 
there's the size of it compared to a man. That's a big bird. He might even be able to take after a man and chew him up a bit. Uh, how did they fly? With a barometric pressure of three and three and a half times the present barometric pressure, the bird would not have any difficulty flying. I don't believe it would be any difficulty. This would explain the certain flying dinosaurs, petrosaurs, how they could fly. Again, they would fly through the atmosphere, which was much more dense, be easier to fly through them. Another problem with the definition of the word kinds in Genesis 1:11, 12, 21, 24 to 25, and 6:20. One can be certain that the St. Bernard and Chihuahua dogs are from the same kind. This is one criterion for a kind that's set forth in Genesis 1 that you can reproduce. The variation between the St. Bernard and the Great Dane, the Mexican Chihuahua, Chihuahua is quite extensive. Could not there have existed a like variation in the reptile kinds as well, and only the, the smaller kinds were allowed on the ark, and that would have ruled out the big ones existing after the flood. And, and, and if even if some were on the ark, the large ones, they were probably come in as very young ones and uh, then were allowed to grow after the flood. But they were killed off by the change in the environment or by men because of his fear of them as well. There's a St. Bernard and a Chihuahua dog, a St. Bernard and a Chihuahua. And these are both breeds of dogs, quite a large difference in the sizes. Here's a Great Dane and a Chihuahua. And a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. These are breeds of dog again. Other possibilities that God knew these larger variations could not survive after the flood, and he only directed the smaller variations should come into the ark. He sent the little ones in the ark, not the big ones. No problem. Even today, animals are becoming extinct. Why doesn't the Bible explicitly refer to dinosaurs? because the word dinosaur entered the English language in 1841. <laughs> and the King James Version uh, was uh, translated in 1611, came out, and it was revised in about 1769. So the present King James Version that we use is a 1769 version of the King James. And again, 1841 was when that word dinosaur was introduced into the English language. Sir Richard Owen coined the word in 1841, addition of the report of the British Association of Advancement of Science. So he actually coined the word here. Right? Merriam Webster tells us this, and you can cite Merriam Webster. Let me summarize it in the last number of years. I know this is a little longer tonight, but I wanted to cover all this. There's no doubt that dinosaurs existed, they were killed in the flood and existed after the flood. The nature of the antediluvian atmosphere partially explains the longevity of the dinosaurs, therefore their large size. The greater longevity explains the large size size of the dinosaurs, since they were probably reptiles, and not the large size of all of them, because there were many of the dinosaurs, most of them were small. Some of the dinosaurs exist today in forms that were smaller than the antediluvian dinosaurs. Even if they had a big variety, it just doesn't live as long. The antediluvian Earth had super fertile soil, hyperbaric atmosphere, no mutations, all of which enhance the growth of ectotherms, cold-blooded animals. Remember that we, as we looked at this, we also could uh, come up, and when we looked at the Komodo dragon, for example, the small, young juvenile Komodo dragons live in trees and eat insects. The larger ones uh, live on the ground come out of the trees. And so we, we see a different action on the part of them as they age. It's possible some of your dinosaurs were that way too, just like the Komodo dragons, that they uh, lived up in trees and then they come down when they got big. And so we had many of them up in the trees eating smaller animals and uh, then coming down as they got big, too big to live in the trees. Hope this has been helpful to you. We will be looking at chapter eight next week. And as we look in chapter eight, we'll be looking at this more in, uh, in this study.